Plastic doesn't cost very much. So to sell an almost worthless material to a customer, its innate poverty has to be combined with extraordinary creativity. This creativity was made possible by melting technology, which enabled shapes to be obtained that were formerly impossible. A plastic chair no longer has anything in common with a Louis XV chair. Take this small dressing table, for example. At first glance, it's just an ordinary cylinder. But when you pull here, hey presto, you've got an upholstered chair. And here, you have a mirror. Le miroir. The fascinating thing about plastic is that it can be fashioned into any shape required. But today, plastic is also the backbone of our society. We hardly notice this supporting function. Plastics are simply taken for granted. They permeate every area of our everyday lives. And not only in the form of the many articles in daily use, like toothbrushes, microwave ovens, telephones, furniture, packaging, and functional clothing. Indeed, without plastic, our entire world of information and communication, as well as modern medicine, would be inconceivable. Today, how could we ever do without CDs, heart valves, or chip cards? Plastic is crude oil. The production of petrol gives rise to a byproduct which, with the help of catalytic crackers, is used to obtain polyethylene. This comes to us in the form of a granulate. We liquefy it and blow it into plastic film, which undergoes further processing. The plastic sector will expand even more. With so many single households today, smaller and smaller units are required in the food sector. And this multiplicity of foodstuffs couldn't be manufactured without the possibilities offered by plastic packaging. But plastic is not only practical, colourful and soft to the touch, many plastic materials give off dangerous chemicals throughout a product's entire life. Blood tests carried out all over Europe by the WWF have shown that all of us carry traces of additives from plastics, like softeners for instance. Plastic is basically a brittle material and softeners are used to make plastic products more flexible. Then there are flame retardants which ensure that plastics don't catch fire easily. But although softeners are introduced into plastic products, they don't form a permanent bond with them. So they're released during use. As we all know, after a while plastic material becomes brittle. That's because these substances have escaped. They're in the air around us, in house dust. They're part of our environment and we inhale them. 
Since a child's organs are still developing, these chemical substances pose a far greater threat to youngsters than to adults. Plastic toys in particular often contain a large volume of softeners which make a teething ring pleasant to bite on. The problem is that these softeners have been shown to have a carcinogenic effect. When a child puts a plastic ring in its mouth, softeners dissolve out and are ingested. They can then result in diseases like cancer. In 2007, the European Union passed a law banning the use of softeners in toys, but for the time being, only in toys. Many softeners are known to act like hormones. That's why they're also called hormone mimics. The hormone mimic phenomenon was first discovered in marine creatures like fish and sea snails, and also in amphibians and alligators. Scientists found a direct correlation between increased concentrations of hormone mimics and abnormalities in the creature's reproductive organs. Since then, a large number of similar studies have focused on the human body. They too have revealed that disorders such as reduced fertility are on the rise, especially amongst Europeans. There is also a correlation between the incidence of these anomalies and the intake of hormone mimics. Separated plastic household waste ends up at a refuse sorting plant. In Germany, this amounts to nearly 60 kilograms per head per year. The total volume in 2006 was nearly 5 million tons. And that's just household and packaging waste. Professor Michael Braungart is one of Europe's most celebrated environmental chemists. He wants to revolutionize our world. In fact, if he had his way, every existing product would have to be reinvented or redesigned, as he puts it. Conventional glass is printed on with ceramic paints that contain heavy metals as well as chlorine. So when it's recycled, there is always a dioxin problem. We print on glass in such a way that the printing material combusts quite harmlessly. In other words, there is no emission problem and no ceramic residue. These printing paints are just as important for plastic. When plastic is imprinted with harmful paint, the entire recycling process is useless because heavy metals, chlorine and dioxins, are introduced. When destruction is reduced a little, people think the environment is being protected. Leave your car at home, they say, and protect the environment. That's like claiming to protect your child by only smacking it twice instead of five times. But less destruction still doesn't mean protection. So we have to define conservation in such a way that we really do protect the environment, that we are actively useful and beneficial to other creatures. Even at the planning stage of a product, thought must be given to how and where its useful life will end. This means that each constituent must initially be non-toxic and all constituents must be easily separable. Traditionally, people think in a linear way. In a cradle-to-grave approach, they use materials, then take them to a dump. Because the waste has been disposed of, they think they're protecting the environment. Ours is a cradle-to-cradle approach. Our materials are returned to the the various cycles. No other creature on earth creates waste, only man. So we reinvent things so that they're useful either biologically or technologically. Everything that wears out is designed so that it can be returned to biological cycles. Everything that breaks down, that changes biologically, like foodstuffs and detergents, is redesigned to be biologically useful. Everything that is merely used is returned to technical cycles. That's why we say cradle to cradle and not cradle to grave. Plastic waste, especially bottles, is collected separately in special systems and sorted. Some of it is turned into low quality plastic, which is used to make garden furniture or street posts. Pet beverage bottles are partly used to produce new bottles.
Most of the waste, however, is compacted into large bales and shipped abroad, in particular to China. There, the bottles are shredded, cleaned, melted down, and re-exported worldwide in the form of fleece pullovers. What used to be the impressive feature of plastic, the fact that it is not only practical but also virtually imperishable, has suddenly become a curse. This plastic waste was washed up on the coast of San Francisco after a nighttime storm. The weather situation in the North Pacific is such that, basically, there's always an air eddy circling over the water masses, and the current in the ocean is influenced by the air masses above it. This phenomenon in the North Pacific means that we have a maelstrom which, in a clockwise direction, attracts everything coming from the coast of North America and Asia. It has been discovered that plastic products coming from these two coasts spend up to 16 years in this maelstrom. Then they are spat out, so to speak, and end up on the beaches of Hawaii, for example. We believe that in the summer months, this maelstrom attains an area the size of Central Europe. We shouldn't imagine this plastic carpet to be like a refuse dump on land, with gulls circling overhead and rats scurrying around on it. It's a carpet of waste which, in part, drifts a few meters below the surface. We dived in this area and it was unbelievable. Land is hundreds of nautical miles away, yet you still see these yellow, red, blue and green splashes of color, tiny bits of plastic. We've taken samples with nets and compared the volume of plastic we found with the quantity of animal plankton, the microorganisms that live in the sea. We found that the water column in open water, hundreds of nautical miles from the coast, contains six times more plastic than animal life. One major problem is that chemicals like DDT or PCB become deposited on these plastic particles. Once they're ingested by microorganisms, they're in the food chain, because the microorganisms are devoured by the creatures that feed on them. These in turn fall prey to their natural foes and so on. So basically these chemicals become more and more concentrated as they pass along the food chain. The creatures at the end of it get the entire load, and among them is man himself. As a rule, the raw material used to make plastic is crude oil, but with oil reserves limited, over the last few years, bioplastics, as they are known, have been produced from maize starch. These comparable products are decomposable and do not require the addition of dangerous softeners. A highly interesting development is taking place in the plastic sector, where scientists have also begun developing materials which are no longer manufactured in the customary way from crude oil, but from renewable primary products. 
These bioplastics are often biodegradable and can already be found on the market in diverse forms. Like packaging for fruit and vegetables, for example. These particular tomatoes were grown ecologically. The film looks exactly like ordinary plastic packaging. However, it is made from renewable raw materials, in this case, maize. The advantage of biodegradable bags like this is that, unlike conventional plastic bags, they can be disposed of at home in a bio-waste bin. Bioplastics function just like normal plastics and look exactly the same. This symbol, however, indicates that the product is completely biodegradable and compostable. As a rule, such products are made from renewable raw materials. The trend is to move away from crude oil. Indeed, in the future, we will simply have to become less dependent on fossil resources and instead use renewable resources, like agricultural materials. What is particularly exciting about products made from such materials is that they have special properties which differ somewhat from those of the conventional plastics in use today. Here, for instance, we have breathable film, which ensures that perishable products like fruit and vegetables stay fresh longer. So even if they weren't biodegradable or ecologically acceptable, there would still be many reasons for using these new plastics. Many plastic products that are part of our everyday lives are virtually imperishable and, in time, release many of their often hormonally active additives into the environment. Spread by wind and rain or illegal refuse disposal in the sea, today they can be found all over our planet, even in marine regions far from civilization. The softeners contained in plastic products evaporate. Since they don't form a firm bond with the plastic matrix, they can escape, basically every time a PVC floor is washed. Then the dirty water enters the sewage system. Often it contains many substances that do not break down in wastewater treatment plants. They're then transported further. To some extent, they accumulate in fish or else they're carried by wind and rain as far as the Arctic. The WWF has worked with scientists who have studied polar bears. There is clear evidence that animals living in the wild in the Arctic are already affected. Concentrations of environmental toxins that have already been banned, and also of industrial chemicals like DDT and PCB, are already present in the Arctic, and they act like hormone mimics. They influence the immune system, and also the reproductive organs of marine creatures, right through to polar bears. Random tests carried out among polar bears produced alarming results. Above all, the hormonally similar effect of softeners, pesticide residues and flame retardants that have accumulated in the Arctic over decades have a massive effect on the hormone balance of polar bears, especially their metabolism, immune system, growth, fertility and sexual development. Okay. When the hormonally potent substances in plastic are released, they can have a wide range of effects. Evidence has been found in various species of infertility and masculinization, in fact of everything that can happen to organisms under the influence of hormones. Scientists have even found male polar bears with two penises and females that are infertile. This is a huge problem that must be tackled. From a preventive point of view, the use of such hormonally potent substances should be banned.
In a complex interaction process, hormones control not only the development and function of the reproductive organs, but also of the brain and the immune system. As substances alien to the body, chemicals produced artificially by man can affect the functioning of the body by intensifying, reducing, or even totally suspending the effect of hormones. The combined weight of the ants on our planet, for example, is around four times greater than that of its human population. But ants are not an environmental problem because they always return their materials to various cycles. Man is the only creature that generates waste, yet we should follow three principles. One, ensure that all waste is nutrition, material that is returned entirely to the nutrient cycle. Two, use only renewable energy. And three, make sure that we support all other creatures. Not that we ourselves are less harmful, but that we do at least sustain biodiversity. This doesn't mean saving, doing without or avoiding. It means wasting intelligently, so that other creatures also benefit. This approach can be reflected, for instance, in an office chair, like this. We have chosen every constituent in such a way that it is a technical nutrient. This chair doesn't break, nor does it wear out, it's just used. In other words, this plastic is designed in such a way that it can be melted down again. It no longer has a long life, but a defined utility period, so I know when I will get it back. Take this arm, it's the way people want it. We have no wish to re-educate them and say they have to do without something. We have simply replaced light PVC with a plastic that can be returned to cycles indefinitely, so we no longer use softeners which can destroy fertility, as in the case of PVC. We define every constituent right at the outset, and that enables us to achieve genuine recycling. For most designers, form and appeal take priority. The components of the materials used are rarely analyzed. Designers at Studio 7.5 in Berlin, however, have shown great commitment in creating the first fully recyclable chair for America's second biggest manufacturer of office furniture. The graphite-colored parts are made of nylon, partly reinforced with fiberglass. This light green element is polypropylene. The two represent different chemical groups within the large plastic sector. Naturally, for recycling purposes, they must be easily separable in order to be returned to different cycles. The back can be used up to 80 times for the same purpose. That's because we know exactly what's in it and how the material will perform. We achieve the technical features of this back, the need for it to be flexible in some areas and more rigid in others through this pattern of holes. It enabled us to resort to a much simpler type of material. So the intelligent step here lies not in the material used, but in the material not used. It lies in the geometry. We can all remember the time when people got so tired of hearing about the whole ecology issue. The frequent response to the need to behave ecologically was a policy of avoidance, so to speak. If I don't do anything, then I can't do anything wrong. Naturally, for us, the cradle-to-cradle approach of McDonnell Braungart was a very positive approach for designers, because Braungart, of course, would say, no, don't avoid making something new. Each generation should have the chance to make its own statement. This just has to be done correctly and cleverly. It's just like every tree sheds its leaves in autumn. They fall to the ground as material and reappear in spring in the form of new leaves. Traditionally, industry tries to think as efficiently as possible. 
It has a product and tries to cause the least amount of damage while maximizing its profits by selling as much as possible. We try, first of all, to see where the material will end up, what will happen to it, how it could be reworked. In principle, we are like the emperors of ancient Rome who were told to think of the end. Because whenever you think of the end, something different always occurs to you with regard to the beginning, and by this I mean that all things can be reinvented. Dinge nochmal neu erfinden.